now if you'd like. Um, we just we went unorthodox tonight, right? Only two songs. Okay. And I'm probably going to preach a little bit shorter tonight and let you out a little bit earlier, early enough that we can have notes for floats. All right. Somebody did say, whenever you say you're going to have a long sermon, it's not long. And whenever you say you're not going to have a long sermon, it is long. But uh, I don't think we'll do that tonight. Uh, is there anyone who has not yet gotten a map and would like a map? Pastor Perry's got, I don't know, five or six of them. And... Um, I'm going to refer to it a little bit tonight. These are the, a map of the unconquered territories. And you can take your Bibles and go to Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3. Did you run out? Okay. Sorry if you ran out. We'll have to find more, make more later. All right. Maybe my favorite judge. I know that doesn't mean a lot because I say that uh, occasionally, but um, Judges chapter 3, we've got a real man here, and I like Ehud. This is a great story, a great account, but once again, we would begin where we always begin with the judges, in that a judge or the previous judge has died, Israel has experienced 40 years of peace, and what do we find them doing? The same thing they do in all of the judges. They drift from the Lord. They fall back into sin. And they fall under the captives. Alright, so this time we're going to look at the, what we'll call the Moabite oppression. So they're being oppressed now by the Moabites. Again, every one of Israel's uh, oppressions is going to come under... Uh, or every one of the judges is going to fall under a certain type of oppression. The first one we looked at was from outside. It was Babylonian, from outside of Israel. This one is from, we can call it within, it's kind of the fringe, but it's Moab, the Moabites. And so they serve. There's this great verse, verse 12, they begin to serve other gods. It's not a great verse, it's a bad verse. But uh, it tells us what's going on. It gives us uh, the springboard. And so just read it with me. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And so they, they, they've been following other gods earlier. Uh, the phrase was used, they, fell, they followed the Baals and Ashtaroths. And it's just because those are the two most common false gods. And so they just go following and pursuing again the false gods of the land, which is the issue. This is the continual issue. They fall into sin. They cry out to God. God sends a deliverer. The deliverer brings them peace. And does that generation learn from their ways and pass that on to the next generation? No. Because the very next generation falls into their own idolatry, follows the same pattern, do they then pass on to their children the heritage of following the Lord? No. And it just goes through that sin cycle over and over again. So this is a good time for us to ask, as we're kind of in the beginning of Judges, are you teaching the next generation to pursue the Lord with their heart? Are you instructing them in what is purity and what the purity that God calls us to? Do you even see it as your responsibility? Now listen, I'm not saying your kids even. Obviously, it's your job to train your children to walk with the Lord. But I think it's the job of us as a church to train all generations to do that, to pass that on whether it be your children or not. And so we have the story here of Ehud. And we're not going to get very far into it. We'll have to pause. I already read verse uh, 12, would you read with me verse 13? Then he, that's Ehud, gathered himself, the people of Ammon, or I'm sorry, not Ehud, that's Eglon. Uh, then he, Eglon, gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, went and defeated Israel, and took possession of the city of Palms. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. All right, if you have your map, if you don't have a map, we'll get you a map for next time. But if you have your map, you can barely see Moab on the bottom left hand, or sorry, my left, 
bottom right hand corner of your map, uh, Moab is on the eastern side of the Jordan River and would have been really the first uh, country people that they encountered when they came up to take the land. And so now Moab has come and they, uh, they've come in this entourage where Eglon is the king and they are camped, encamped. Let me get my map right. They're camped uh, in Jericho, the city of Palms. So if your Bible reads the city of Palms, like mine, it's Jericho it's speaking of. This is uh, the place that was absolutely decimated by God, left to ruins, and Israel was told, do not rebuild the city. Well, they didn't, but Eglon did, and he's rebuilt the city now, and he's living there, and it's really instrumental uh, because it is the, the staging point to the rest of Israel. All right, with that said, we have, though, the tribe of Benjamin at the middle of all this. We have Ehud, who's strengthened. You see this in verse 15. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them. Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. By him the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Let me pause here and let's talk. I want to refresh your memory about the tribe of Benjamin because we talked about Benjamin in, in Judges 19, 20, and 21. And Judge, uh, Benjamin was wicked in the sense that they allowed sin to persist among the, the, the men of Gilead, the people of Gilead, right? We have the story of the Levite who comes with his concubine. He's traveling back to the hill country of Ephraim. And as he travels and he stops in the city of Gibeah, they try to commit with him the sins that should not even be mentioned. They're so wicked, sins of uh, uh, egregious uh, sexual sins, and it is there that they take his concubine and they, they, they murder her eventually. And he calls all of Israel, this Levite, to bring the people to come and to gather against Benjamin and punish Benjamin because Benjamin, the nation, the tribe, sorry, the tribe of Benjamin refuses to deal with the sin of the men of Gilead. And what happens? There's this horrible war that takes place and both sides lose people but benjamin especially benjamin is reduced to 600 men only no women no children no livestock no cities simply 600 men and they're given daughters or they're given wives of the daughters of israel of different regions in chapter 20 and chapter 21 and it's from there that ehud comes he rises from whether he be one of those 600 or the son or even maybe possibly the grandson. It can't be have, have been too long. 18 years they've been oppressed. The, nation, or the tribe of Benjamin is slowly being rebuilt and Ehud rises to the top. Now listen, Benjamin is in the absolute central section of Israel. That's why it's kind of in the, kind of in the middle of your map. Uh, there we go. Benjamin is kind of in the middle of your map, but it's really the central of all the high country. There's a great plateau. It's 11 miles long, 8 miles wide, and it's where the majority of all the battles and, and activities of the Old Testament took place. The plains of Benjamin. And it's there that Ehud is from. Ehud, I, I, I would say, would be the first redemptive result of the purge of wicked Benjamin. But we see he's a dedicated man. He's dedicated in a couple ways. Verse 15, we get the great uh, description that he is dedicated to his craft of warfare. I love Ehud. Okay. Ehud is a bloody man, yes, but he, he is a warrior. There is no doubt about this. He's a left-handed, many people call him the left-handed assassin, but he's left-handed. Now that does not just mean that he writes with his left hand. He is a trained warrior who is ambidextrous. That's what it's saying. In fact, uh, we can read many passages. Judges chapter 20 is one that gives us great insight. Judges 20 verse 16 says that, that at the time, uh, Benjamin had 700 men who were left-handed and could sling a stone at a hair's breadth. So these are men who are skilled to use the sword with the right or the left hand, and they're skilled with the sling, right and left hand, able to hit uh, a hair uh, off of somebody's head. Now, you could be 
the guinea pig, not me. But the uh, but Bible says they were good. They were good. These guys are specialized in warfare. So he's dedicated to this craft. It's also he's dedicated to the holiness of the Lord. Now we know what happens, right? Once he kills Eglon, he calls the people to follow him to war. And in verse 28, you can jump with me. Jump ahead to verse 28. Scripture says, Then he said to them, Ehud said to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hands. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan leading to Moab and did not allow anyone to cross over. Notice when he, he cries out, He is the deliverer. All through the book of Judges, it calls what we would say the judges, it calls them deliverers. And yet here, what does he say? He says, God is the deliverer. God has delivered your enemies in your hands. Now listen, Ehud's the one who killed Eglon. He killed the king. Yeah, he's, Ehud's the one who began the war. But he very quickly recognizes God is the deliverer. God is the one who's in control. So he's dedicated to the Lord as well. And we'll come back to this truth here uh, at, at the end, but, but take this time, just to, a moment, to assess your own life. How do Christians steal the glory of God. Here he gives God the glory. He could have easily have said, he said, I have delivered your enemy into your hand. Follow me and come with me. But he doesn't. He pushes it back to the Lord. He gives the Lord the credit. Sometimes Christians steal the glory of God when they fail to give him credit. Or they take the giftings that God has given them and use them for their own personal well-being, not for the Lord. Or when Christians claim special status or seek power with the wisdom that God has given them. How are you tempted to take glory for the work of God in your life? Well, here Ehud arrives to give tribute. He's going to give tribute to Eglon as he's been elected to do. And he arrives... But we get, this, oh, we get this other little bit of information. Verse 15, When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. By him, the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Before I uh, get to that, let's just talk quickly about the, the coalition that Eglon is leading. It's not just Moab. They're made up of, of Ammonites as well. And uh, they're made up of... Um, I forgot the other ite. Amalekites, thank you. Uh, so they've got a coalition of three nations have gathered together. Eglon simply the head. He's the chief general. And he's successful. We know he's successful. How do we know he's successful? Because he's fat. I'm being serious. We know he's successful because he's fat. He is rich. He has plundered many nations. He has taken control. He sits and, and directs men, and he has gotten fat in the process. He sits up in his summer palace here on a bit of a throne, as we'll talk about in a moment, but he is no doubt in charge. He's also brutal. He's a brutal warrior. Moab was known for their wickedness, and, and he, he would have been wicked. He would have been the first, uh, not that he was necessarily the leader, he might not have even been alive, but one of the first nations, as I said, that would have oppressed and tried to fight against Israel. And he leads this group composed of Moabites, Ammonites, and Amalekites. And where do they sit? The same place that Israel's enemies sat when they entered the Promised Land last time. Now, they're not entering, they're already in it, but they're back to Jericho. This eastern gate to the highlands. And so there he sits, controlling waiting for tribute to roll in. And so the nations would have come. Benjamin being the closest, we don't know how much of, of Israel he controlled, but Benjamin being the closest, he brings the tribute. And what all it is is a bunch of, of money paying Eglon not to kill them. Right? He, he's, a, he's, a, he's the bully who says, if you pay me, I won't beat you up. That's what he is. If you pay me, I won't invade your land, take your women and children, uh, take your livestock, burn your homes. If you pay me money, I won't do those things. That's essentially what he's doing. Eighteen years it's persisted. 
And Ehud brings the tribute, this financial payment. Which, by the way, it would have been a constant reminder of the people's failure to drive the enemy out of the land. I mean, imagine, I don't know how often they would have paid at least once a year. They have to gather together, everybody asking, gathering money together to find enough to pay him off so he won't come and invade you. It's a reminder of the the drain uh, on the people, but evidence of their rebellion to God. They'd failed to follow the Lord, and now they suffer. Financially, they're under pressure to continue to pay tribute, to stay safe. But it's a false safety, right? If he doesn't get it, what's he going to do? He's going to invade them. Are they really that safe? They've compromised to the point that they believe they have little choice but to pay tribute. And we too, we can pursue the same style of faithlessness. This disobedience and unfaithfulness to God led them to to new, new bondage under a sinful regime. And now their fears keep them paralyzed. Can I tell you, I think that our society is plagued by fear. Our society is so fearful and kept, and even Christians, kept in a state of fear. We fear the financial downfall of our nation. And listen, is there, is there a possibility of it? Sure. Things look pretty bleak sometimes. While we reside in the richest nation to ever walk the planet, but there's things to fear. We fear social collapse. I mean, that's unraveling before our eyes at times. We fear the health of the populace to the point where we have a whole vast pandemic over something that is beyond our control. And this fear goes deep into our lives when we individually become controlled by it. We become paralyzed by fear and we stop trusting the Lord. We fear being alone. We fear and stress over not meeting expectations at work. We wonder if we'll have enough money to do the things that we want. We worry about rejection or failure or death or the future or our relationships, and it goes on and on. And fear keeps people trapped and stunted spiritually. It drains people of their vitality. What do you fear? What do you fear? Christ, the truth is we we shouldn't fear when we have the Lord. And I'm not talking about a trite, yeah, God's on my side, but a genuine confidence in who God is. Because really, that's what fear, fear reveals the parts of God that we don't understand or we don't want to understand. And yet God has not given us a spirit of fear, has he? 2 Timothy chapter 2, or chapter 1, verse 7. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but what has He given us? A spirit of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Is not God in control of all things? Is not, does not God love you with a perfect love? Not like the love that we get from other people, but a perfect love. Does not God care more about us than the birds of the air? We fear man and we fear the ways of man when God, when God is far from us, or rather when we're far from God. Now listen, listen to what it, uh, God says to Ezekiel. Ezekiel's given this message to go stand before leaders and declare their unrighteousness and to do it without fear. But he's very fearful because they have power to throw him in jail. They have power to punish him and persecute him and even kill him if they wanted. And so he's, he's tempted to be afraid. And this is what God says to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 2, verse 6. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words or be dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, O son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. That's a strange spot to end that. Eat what I give you. He's talking about 
literally tells him, open his mouth, and he feeds him a scroll. And what's written on the scroll? The word of God. And it is sweet to his lips. He challenges Ezekiel to preach the truth. All right, back to Ehud and the good stuff with Ehud. And it gets interesting. Ehud has had enough. 18 years, the Lord has raised him up. The difference is he stands out from the people because he fears God. He reverences God. He doesn't fear people. He doesn't fear Eglon, that's for sure. He wants God to get the glory. He wants God to get the reverence that he deserves. And so he will defy the enemy and he will do it even alone. All right, so we have the triumph of the Lord starting in verse 16. Ehud is preparing. And verse 16 says, Now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was double-edged and a cubit in length and fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. So he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. Eglon said, keep silent. And all who attended him went out from him. All right, let's stop. I don't want to spoil the ending here. So Ehud's prepared. He knows what he's doing. And that's what I want you to take away from that. He knows that day when he goes to take the tribute, he has a full plan. And he takes his, makes this double-edged sword, a cubit in length. A cubit is from the elbow to the tip of the fingers. That is a big dagger, right? My, I think mine says dagger. That's a big dagger. And he, he puts it on the inside of his right thigh. That's a big thigh, by the way. And he puts it on the inside of his right thigh. He hides it under the folds of his robe that he would have had. A warrior's robe, probably, but he's, he's trying to appear as a messenger of peace. And so he has it under the folds of his robe, and he comes in before Eglon. I think he probably would have been frisked. I think all of them would have been checked. Leave your weapons at the door kind of a thing. And they pay the tribute. After they pay the tribute, they all leave, and they go a distance. And Ehud says, I gotta go. I left something. I gotta go back. Now I think probably they knew what he was doing. But this is all for appearance's sake. He he proceeds to return to Eglin's palace and he arrives and says, I have a special message for the king. Now listen, from Eglon's point of view, what would that have looked like? The the tribute is paid, Eglon's coffers are full. He's happy. That's a good thing. They all leave, but one guy comes back secretly, kind of sneaks back to talk to him. And Eglon in his pride is always desirous of more information, more power, more control, maybe, hopefully, more money. And so he welcomes him back in. Now listen, it is significant that Ehud placed his dagger on his right thigh. Where would, where would I, as a right-handed man who is not ambidextrous, I would put my sword on the outside of my right side, or if it was a secret dagger, I would put it on the inside of my left thigh so I could draw it out. Never would I put it on the inside of my right to reach. That's not natural. That's, that's unnatural. And yet Ehud is a left-handed warrior. So it doesn't matter which side it's on. And so I think he placed it there to hide it from the people. Bad guards. Not, well, not good at frisking, apparently. So he plans to get alone with Eglon. He traveled all the way to Gilgal. Now, there's three Gilgals in the Bible, and I don't know which one this is. Uh, I don't think it's the one down by the Jordan River, although that one's kind of the closest. I think that there's one way up north. We can say it's not that one. There's one that's in the area of Benjamin. That one makes the most sense. It would have been the stone quarries of Benjamin. And he travels all the way to these stone quarries, and he returns from there, a, a distance uphill. Listen, he's gone far out of his way to give the appearance that he's coming on a secret message. He has traveled uphill mile, many, many miles, up to possibly about 14 miles uphill, and then he returns back to Eglon. So he's gone far out of his way to make this look like a secret mission. He returns to speak with Eglon in this appearance of a secret journey with a secret message. 
Ehud is, I'll put it this way, I'm going to put a good spin on it, he is stealthy. We know he's stealthy from what happens next. For he arrives in the upper chambers, or the cool private chamber of Eglon. Verse 20. So Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chambers. Then he had said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. Then Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from the right side, and thrust it into his belly. Even the hilt went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. Then Ehud went out through the porch and shut the doors in the upper room behind him and locked them. When he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said, he is probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. Ah, what a great statement. So they waited till they, had, they were embarrassed, and still he had not opened the doors of the upper chamber. Therefore they took the key and opened them, and there was their master fallen dead on the floor. But Ehud had escaped while they delayed and passed through the stone images and escaped to Sariah. And it happened when he arrived that he blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains and he led them. Then he said to them, follow me for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down. Did I say follow me? Yeah, follow me. For the Lord has delivered. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day until the hand, under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. It was the best rest they ever got. There's so many good details here, but Ehud is incredibly stealthy. So he's arrived in the upper chambers, the cool chambers. It's called the summer palace. There's different phrases that are used for different parts. All the homes, look, Jericho is miserably hot. And so in the summer, you didn't want to be down in a stuffy home. You wanted to be up on the roof, covered roof. So think of a nice, they had a nice uh, sunsetter, you know, press a little button and the sunsetter came out and covered the porch. Uh, no, they would have had a covered roof with ventilation on the sides, open windows, so the breeze would blow through, so they're protected from the sun, but still felt the cool of the breeze. And it's there in this upper chamber that he has a waiting room, or uh, we could call it a, a, a parlor room, or a, a, a living room, where they would have sat and entertained people. He would have had a bedroom, likely, up there as well, where he could have resided and been comfortable and slept comfortable and he would have had one other room up there a nice little well ventilated bathroom it's a good place to have a bathroom right lots of ventilation no flush toilets in fact the bathroom would have uh, had probably a, a, a passageway that would have fallen down from the i'll call it the throne into a nice catchment system of buckets where the, the measly little servants could, could, could carry away the waste. All right, why do I tell you all that? Because here he is sitting, and he's sitting in this, in this upper chamber, and he rises to listen, and it's at that moment that he had thrust him through the blade, uh, so the hilt, so think of the handle, maybe my hand is the handle, the entire blade all the way up to the handle, into his belly. So, the Bible is true. He was a very fat man. And it enclosed on him so that he just lets it go. He doesn't even try to get it out. It's then, at that moment, that the dirt comes out. Listen, the Bible is exciting. Right? My version, I think it says the entrails. King James uses the word dirt. It's a good word. Okay? Why the dirt? Well, I believe that Eglon is sitting at the porcelain throne. And he's sitting there, and he's, as the, his servants think later, he's covering his feet. Literally, he's dropped his drawers, and he's going to the bathroom, and all of a sudden, Ehud comes in, he's got his sword, and he plunges it through, and he has a doo-doo in his pants. I don't know how else to say that. It's 
as lovely as I can word it. And so what does Ehud do? He locks the chamber doors, the vestibule, and he climbs out. The question is, if the doors are locked, how did he climb out? I believe the language is indicating. Now, listen, there could have been a staircase on the outside of the house leading down. I don't think that was uh, necessarily the, the layout. I think there is one way to climb out of the upper chambers, and that is through the porcelain throne uh, and out the trap door that the servants would have used. There's no doubt about this. He secretly leaves, and nobody knows that he's left. They, they, nobody saw him go. He secretly gets away from the palace, and, and nobody even thought or wondered what was going on for quite some time. So I think he climbed through the, uh, the servant's passage, I'll call it, you know, where the servant reaches in and gets that nice uh, bedchamber that has been used and cleans it up for wicked Eglon. I mean, this, is, this guy is dedicated, right? There's no doubt about that. He is dedicated. And so he climbs out, and I, I think it's, funny that there they are, the servants, they're standing in verse 24, they're waiting for him to come out, and they think, "Uh uh-oh, he's been in there a long time, even for a man. He's been in there a long time, covering his feet, and they're all embarrassed. You knock on the door. No, you go in there and check on him. I'm not. I had to do it last time. You do it this time. They don't want to interrupt as he uses the bathroom, and so they wait. And they wait, and they wait. And what does the Bible say? They wait so long that they are embarrassed. Finally, they go in and they find him dead on the floor. Now listen, we love to read the Bible in this quick, successive timeline. But for for Ehud to leave there and go to the hill country of Ephraim would have been probably a a, a two-day journey. At least one very long day, and the day's already been half spent. And then to gather the armies of Israel together, or what armies they took, and go back to the forge would have taken more time as well. So I don't think this is necessarily a night mission the same night. I think a day has passed. Maybe even two days have passed. And what do they do? They go to the forge of the Jordan River, the the place they could wade across. And they wait. And they wait for the Amalekites, and the Ammonites, and the Moabites to flee from that land. And as they flee, they pick them off. 10,000 mighty warriors of Moab die. And I really like the phrase, they're all stout men of valor. Um, That's what we should start calling our men's ministry, stout men of valor. Maybe not. The best part is that last line. The land had rest for 80 years. One man was willing to stand up. And even alone to bring about the freedom of the nation. And yet he made sure that God got the victory. He used God used a mighty man who feared the Lord. And he used this man who was fearless and bold. And so he Ehud stands out as a man of valor, a mighty man like the men of David uncompromising and valiant, a warrior who has no problem standing alone. And this is the type of mindset that God wants his children to have. We're unstoppable when we stand with the Lord. God is the one who does the fighting. God is the one who is indefatigable. God is the one who is just and holy and deserves a a righteous declaration. And so we should ask ourselves, are we willing to stand for God even if it means we stand alone? And maybe we stand alone at work, or we stand alone in our family even, or we stand alone in our neighborhood, or we stand alone wherever it is. Are we willing to stand for the truth of who God is, no matter who comes with us or who doesn't? And I'm not saying stand in your own ideas, or stand in your own ambitions, or stand in your own desires or will, but stand in the truth of God to live righteous no matter what everyone else around you is doing, to declare the goodness of God, to give the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
That's what we're called to do. Now, praise the Lord. The room's filled with a bunch of people here who are willing to stand next to us. And so let us be strong. We fight against the wickedness of this world, but we do it in the strength of who God is, not who we are. We do it for His glory, not for our own. So I ask you, what's holding you back from being bold in declaring the truth, bold in evangelism, bold in declaring the goodness of God to the world around you? May we have this valiant heart like Ehud has. Bloody man, yes, right? Different day and age. Shrewd, crafty warrior, but he was someone who was prepared to stand alone, and we should be as well. Would you pray with me and then sing a song? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we want you to be honored and glorified. We want to stand firm for the truth no matter what's going on around us. You have told us what is truth, what is right. You've given us your word and we've eaten it and it is sweet. May we share that sweetness with others. Lord, help us to be prepared to be warriors in a fearful world. That it would not drive us from obedient faithfulness to you. So we thank you for your goodness, for your love. Help us to be warriors for the honor and the glory of your name. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.